Uh, but we're all here to celebrate the work of uh, Satyajit Ray, of course. And we have the um, special delight of being able to greet uh, Amrita Biswas uh, to talk to us about a very special film uh, from Satyajit Ray's oeuvre, namely Jal Sagar, uh, The Music Room from 1958. Uh, Amrita is a PhD candidate in the Configurations of Film Research Collective at the Goethe Universität right here in Frankfurt. She completed her MPhil though in Cinema Studies at the School of Arts and Aesthetics at the um, JNU uh, in New Delhi. Uh, she received her BA originally from St. Xavier's College in Calcutta in English and then pursued her postgraduate in film studies from Jadavpur University, in, also in Kolkata. Uh, her research interests include post-partition trauma in the films of Ritwik Gatak, as well as media infrastructures of alternative and popular Bengali cinema. Uh, she has contributed to a range of different um, collections and journals, including Pandemic Media, Accidental Archivism, and Who Owns the Images, as well as Frontiers of South Asian Culture. Uh, alongside that, her further articles of hers have been published in the journal Studies in South Asian Film and Media and Illuminates. Uh, she was even awarded the Erasmus Plus Fellowship for conducting research at the Georg August Universität in Göttingen, and she has also received grants from the DAAT to conduct research at the Academy Film Archive in the USA. Uh, but today she'll be talking to us about a very special topic, uh, namely uh, res the question of restoring Ray, uh, and in particular, the geopolitics of uh, film preservation in the case of Jalsaga. Um So before we welcome uh, Amrita up to the stage, I also want to give thanks also to our sponsors. Uh, the Obviously, the, thank you to the DFF for hosting us, uh, as well as uh, the Contrast uh, Research Cluster, the uh, Freunde und Förderer der Universität at the Goethe-Universität Goethe and the Hessische Film und Medien uh, Academy. Uh, and there is also a, a accompanying this uh, film series, there is also a seminar where we bring in uh, various different guests to discuss uh, the topic India as method, so Indian cinema more broadly, not just uh, not just Satyajit Ray. Uh, to, and they, those take place every Friday morning after the screening uh, at 10 a.m. Normally in room IG1414 at the Goethe Universität, uh, West End campus. Uh, but tomorrow's session featuring, uh, Ritika, tell me the name of the guest, because it's not Amrita. Uh, Sama Siddiqui, uh, that will be taking place uh, over Zoom because she is stuck in Berlin uh, and victim, also a victim of the barn strike. Uh, but we'll, we, we will be resuming normal service with the seminars in the uh, next session uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Right now, though, I want us to all give a warm welcome to Amrita to talk to us about Jalsagar. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for sharing with me an interest in Jal Chaghar, uh, which you see on the screen right now. I took this photo about uh, three to four weeks back when I was in Kolkata for my doctoral field work, and I took this at Cholochitra Shotoborsho Bhavan, also known as the West Bengal State Film Archive. So I went there because I wanted to know what elements uh, that archive has uh, for the films of rape. Um, and Rumitanath Rumito Dash, who's the head of the archive there, he was kind enough to offer me a tour of the different walls. So I went from one wall to another. And I think I saw this um, in the last wall and I was very excited. And I'm like, oh, you're Josh Agar. And he was like, yes, Amrita, we have the original camera negative. And I was very distrustful. I said, no, uh, could you please check and confirm? Uh, probably it's not the OCN. He was insistent. I was equally skeptical. Um, he checked the catalog, which mentioned that there that they had the negatives, but the detail was missing as to whether it was the dupe negative or whether it was the original camera negative. Uh, so the archivist was called in, who went to the vault, pulled down the cans, inspected the element, turned out uh, that they had the dupe negative. Uh, to which Mr. Dash was very surprised and he was like, Omrita, it's the first time you're visiting uh, the vault. How could you be so sure that we do not have the OCN? Now, the specific aspect about my immense confidence that Bengal, or even India for that matter, cannot have the OCN uh, of Jal Chaghar forms the crux of this talk. Uh, this, by the way, is the original poster scanned uh, and collected at the uh, Aurora Film Corporation, which was the producer and distributor for the film. Uh, but before I move to discuss the restoration, I thought it will be fun and productive to talk a bit about 
the context within which the film was both produced and exhibited because that will offer you a sense of the specific film culture in Calcutta uh, within which Jal Shaghar released on um, 10th of October 1958. So you see the sets here, uh, the ornate mirror, um, pillars and the chandelier, very famous, uh, very extensively talked and written about. Um, the charm of the chandelier was also not lost on contemporary film critics. Uh, for instance, um, Dillis Powell, he writes about Jal Shaghar and he notes, where was the film shot? I have tried in vain to discover, and yet the background is of interest. The vast crumbling mansion with its portico, its Corinthian capitals, its terrace, its fountain. Was it perhaps built for some Indian prince? Amidst an upstart modern society whose line was destined to die. Exotic in the featureless plain. The facade has a melancholy beauty. The interior sets too are splendid. Ornate mirrors and chandeliers swinging and vibrating to the music. The chandelier was made on the studio floor itself. Uh, for those who have attended former lectures in this series, uh, other speakers have already pointed out that Ray was very attentive to details. Ray wanted the chandelier to not just be proportionate to the size of the room, but he also wanted it to have scalpel-like precision so that light is reflected in a specific way. So craftsmen were brought in from Lucknow, which is a city in the uh, state of Uttar Pradesh in India. Uh, they remained on the studio uh, sets for more than a month. Uh, glass was bought separately. Uh, they cut the glass, uh, the lamps were made, and then it was assembled right on the set. Studio sets were, however, used only for the indoor shots. Uh, for the outdoor shots, the location was Neem Tita Rajbari, located in the Murshidabad district of Bengal. Ray notes in his article, uh, winding route to the music room. No one could have described in words the feeling of utter desolation that surrounded the palace. The podda had changed its course over the years so that now there were endless stretches of sandy waste where once had been villages. The palace itself, Greek pillars and all, was a perfect materialization of my dream image. It stood looking out over the desolation with a worn and tragic dignity. The Nimtita palace was perfect except that the music room, it did have one for Ganendra Narayan's uncle, Upendra Narayan Chaudhary had been a patron of music, much like the nobleman in our story, but it was not impressive enough to serve as the setting for the sumptuous soirees that I had planned. This would have to be built in a matching style in the studio. The music hall was thus constructed in the Nakaldanga studio, which you see on the screen right now. And the film was mounted on a budget of approximately 90,000 INR, which uh, given the cost of production that was there in Calcutta back in 1950s was quite a decent sum. Narkal Danga was owned by Aurora Film Corporation, uh, which produced and distributed. A, a, a clarification here that some of the credits would note Ray as a producer. The reason being that back in the 50s, uh, there was no such uh, thing as the production manager uh, in Calcutta. So the one who supervised everything would be called the producer. However, uh, it was Aurora that invested into the film and Ray uh, took over supervising uh, everything about the production. And the specific studio was located in northern part of Calcutta, uh, also known as the North Calcutta, which was the cultural hub of the city cultural hub because most of the zamindari estates were built in North Calcutta. Also all the universities, uh, the residence of Ramindranath Tagore, Thakurbari, all of that was in North Calcutta. Now this particular detail about Josh Aghar being shot at Narkel Danga is important for two reasons. Firstly, uh, it offers a clue to the cultural capital that Ray had accrued after the critical acclaim that Pothir Pachali had received. And I say this because George Chagar evidenced a certain change in the dynamics of Ray's collaboration with Aurora. To elaborate on this, um, so when Ray was scouting for producers for Pothir Pachali, Shishir Mullik, who had been a mutual friend of Satyajit Ray and um, Ajit Bose, who was then the managing director of Aurora, uh, Shishir Mulik introduced Ray to uh, Ajit Bose and uh, Ajit Bose read the script and he was like, uh, we are interested in uh, producing this film, but it has to be made by technicians and directors uh, who are employed by the studio because Aurora had fixed directors and technicians who were uh, there on a fixed uh, salary. 
uh, Ray disagreed and eventually uh, the film was produced by the government of West Bengal and Aurora became the distributor for Pothir Pachali. But interesting, interesting for this, when one sees the board meeting reports, uh, one gets a clue that this time it was Ray dictating the terms because everything was like, okay, so the shooting of uh, this film can now happen because Mr. Ray is not available who's shooting now for Porosh Pathor. The shooting of Josh Aghar is therefore postponed until Mr. Ray is available. So everything was now being structured around Ray's schedule and Ray's availability, unlike uh, what would have happened in 1954 prior to Pothar Pachali being uh, released. Uh, another important reason, um, I'm not going to give away the plot of the film, I'm not going to ruin uh, the pleasure of watching Josh Aghar for you, but in a very basic nutshell, the film is about the declining fortunes of a zamindar. And uh, the studio was built on a zamindari estate owned by Binod Bihari Shah. Um, quite a layering of space because a film that is about the declining fortune of a zamindar who's unable to uh, maintain his property was shot in a studio built on an estate uh, which was also uh, in the declining um, uh, state of affairs because Binod Bihari Shah was unable to uh, maintain the huge, and it was around 40 acres of land that uh, this property had, so he was not able to uh, maintain it, and that's why Aurora got it on lease. To speak a bit now about what exactly is Zamindari system, um, Unlike other systems like Mehelwari, uh, or which were also there um, during the colonial time, Zamindari system started with uh, the Permanent Settlement Act, which was brought about in 1793, which while giving um, specific rights to the uh, feudal laws, which is basically that they are now owners of the land. So they do not just take the rent on behalf of the government, unlike what they did previously, but with this act coming into place, Zamindars became the owners and they kind of acted in uh, alignment with the British regime. Um, the system was in place, uh, even though uh, legally it was abolished, the Zamindari system was abolished in 1951, but it was still there. And uh, this became a point for later the Jomi Jar Langultar movement, which was taken up by the Communist Party of India Marxist wing, which can be translated to the land belongs to those who tills it. And that's because a lot of exploitative uh, measures were in place with the zamindari system and uh, peasants were uh, exploited under uh, under the system. And that's why uh, the Jomi Jar Langultar movement happened later. Uh, but uh, zamindars were still respected for their pedigree, uh, for their, they had, so they had massive cultural power, social respectability, um, notorious, uh, if I may say so, for being flamboyant, um, to a certain extent, uh, even um, notorious for being decadent, but they were also great patrons of art and music. But we can talk about that during the discussion round, else I'll be giving you too much about the film already. But this is something that George Aghar delves into, and you see uh, the contrast here with Bisham Borai, who's a zamindar in art story, uh, played by actor Chobi Bishash. And you have uh, Mohim, who's the Nouveau-ish, and who says, because I have no pedigree, I'm a self-made man, and, and that's kind of a dynamic that Jal Shakhar uh, plays into. Uh, this is just to show you some of the production stills uh, taken during the shooting of the film. And with this, I'll move to the context of the film's exhibition. Um, so here you see a page from the booklet uh, which was published by Boshu Shri Cinema Hall uh, on the occasion of Poyla Boishak Jolsha. Uh, to explain, uh, this was kind of a musical soiree that Boshu Shri Cinema Hall organized where classical singers would perform. So people would buy tickets to the cinema hall but not to watch a movie but to watch uh, classical singers perform. And uh, Boshu Shri invited Pandit Ravi Shankar, Vilayat Khan, who also composed the music for Jal Shaghar, uh, Bari Gulam Ali Khan. Uh, Roshan Kumari apparently also performed at Boshu Shri. Uh, as critics have noted, Jal Shaghar is also therefore an excellent documentation of the performative cultures of the times. The film, 
depicting the zamindari culture of the 20th century, however, also taps into the contemporary urban taste for classical music that was part of the very elite cultural project that several industry players in Calcutta participated in during the post-partition period. An example being Boshu Shrish, uh, Poyla Boshak Jolch. And Poyla Boshak is the Bengali New Year. So it would be celebrated to mark the event for Bengalis, but it would not be celebrated by uh, exhibiting a film, but by having classical singers and classical dancers perform on the, for the occasion. Within this particular cultural milieu, Jolchaghar released uh, in Radha, Purna, and Prachi Cinema Hall uh, within Calcutta. And it ran for uh, approximately four weeks in both uh, Radha and Purna and two weeks in Prachi. To just give you a sense of how much the film earned when it did release, uh, just the fourth week's collection at Radha was approximately 12,000 INR, which shows that even though uh, the film uh, did not earn massive profits, but it did recover the cost of production. The profits trickled in later with Criterion's digital restoration of the film, something that I'll come, uh, something I'll, that I'll discuss later. Uh, but this is just to give you a sense that um, the film, besides documenting something, was also very strategically released because back then there was a huge demand for watching classical singers perform. And this is the booklet uh, that was issued. Uh, by Aurora for the release of the film. You see the cover, then you have the Golpang show, which refers to the summary written in Bengali with few stills from the film. <coughs> and moving on, you have the summary also written in English. And the last page of the booklet would usually have the cast and credits. Now, having spoken a bit about production and exhibition, I'll now discuss uh, what is the crux of this talk, uh, the restoration. Uh, so the restoration um, started, uh, it, it, it was uh, the, the fact that race films should be preserved was brought up on 2nd May 1991, when Dr. Dilip Basu, who was a professor of history at the University of California, Santa Cruz, celebrated the birthday of Ray. And he suggested that a film and study collection should be established, then known as the Ray FASC, Ray's, uh, sorry, Basu's proposal found support from both Satyajit Ray, uh, because he was, uh, in 1991, Ray was still alive, and from the vice chancellor of the university. However, the academy's investment into the preservation of Ray's films actively began with Ray's receipt of the honorary Oscar at the 64th Academy Awards in 1992. Now, on the left, you see a letter written by Gregory Peck to the uh, Board of Governors of AMPUS or Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. And I'll just read out a few segments from it, um, which says that Mr. Ray's movies are recognized around the world as examples of film as an art form. He is eminently deserving of our recognition. Aside from the appropriateness of the Academy recognition, I suggest that there is an important public relations factor to be considered with the current US preoccupation with weekly box office figures projected to the press and the TV audience like football scores. Public perception of the industry is that box office figures are our sole measure of success. By honoring Satyajit Ray, the Academy would not only honor a true artist in film, it would remind the public and the media once more that Academy Awards are given for artistic excellence. Uh, the last paragraph uh, shows that Martin Scorsese advocated um, that Mr. Ray should get the award. Just a clarification here that the letter had been written by Ismail Merchant to Carl Malden, who was then the president of Ampers, and um, Merchant wanted uh, Scorsese's uh, vote on that, and Scorsese did support. And that's what uh, Peck here informs to the rest of the board of the governors. The, on the right, you see the press release, uh, which was issued by the Academy Foundation, dated November 5, 92. The press statement declared that a grant had been awarded to Dr. Basu to enable the restoration of the original master negatives of Ray's films. Uh, the grant would also facilitate public access to Ray's work for educational purposes. Besides undertaking a major fundraising campaign for archiving all 40 of the Ray films, so the goal was to preserve all of the Ray titles. The Academy Foundation found these initiatives both significant and timely, and therefore offered Professor Basu's project the use of the Academy archive for preserving the Ray material. On the left, you see a screen grab from an act of faith saving the Opu trilogy, 
uh, where Ray is giving his acceptance speech. He was in Calcutta then, um, uh, on hospital in, in the hospital. Uh, and on the right, um, I know this is a lot of information for you, but unfortunately, uh, the restoration project was a collaboration of several institutions. It shows you uh, what were the institutions that collaborated, Ford Foundation, uh, Merchant Ivory, uh, Indo-US Subcommission, UC Santa Cruz that I already mentioned, uh, but three of these um, are important because they'll keep on recurring in the talk, uh, which is Merchant Ivory Production, owned by Ismail Merchant, who I mentioned uh, some time back, the National Film Development Corporation, Bombay, uh, and uh, AMPUS, of course, but also Society for the Preservation of Satyajit Ray Films India, which was headed and is still headed by Sandeep Ray, the son of Satyajit Ray, also a filmmaker himself. Uh, According to Michael Pogorzelski, the producers who organized the telecast of snippets from Ray's films for the award ceremony, and here I mean this award ceremony that's shown in the Act of Faith, they struggled a lot because uh, the, the elements that they found were degraded, badly scratched, they had missing sections. And that's why Academy had to collaborate with several organizations because it was also a finance intensive besides a te technologically intensive process. To facilitate the endeavor, Mr. David Shepard, who was a specialist in film preservation and a voting member of the Academy, he visited India from December to Jan 1992-1993 along with Professor Basu and the goal of the visit was to inspect the conditions in which the elements of race films survived and in, on occasions where they wouldn't find the OCN, um, the motive was they would find the best surviving element in that case. Now in a letter to Ajit Bose that you see here, uh, Ampus informed Aurora that the company would not have to bear any cost for the scientific examination of the film elements within their possession. The only contribution that was solicited from Mr. Bose was cooperation in the project, which had only academic and non-commercial imperatives in its quest for preserving race works. The proposed budget was also very high. It was over $3 million. To support the formation of archives, uh, at the two locations that the project comprised of back then, Calcutta and Los Angeles. The estimate comprised restoration as well as the production of archival elements, soundtrack negatives, dupe negatives, answer print, release print, and videotape. So it was a very comprehensive uh, plan. Besides the film, there was a provision for also preserving and converting into optical and digital storage formats the documents associated with the films such as notebooks, sketchbooks, illustrations, etc. A set of these papers were proposed to be housed at the Ray FASC in University of California, Santa Cruz, and the other at Nondon or the West Bengal Film Center in Calcutta. However, um, these lie at the Picard Humanities Institute now, which is part of the, I mean, it's adjacent to the UCLA Film and Television Archive, so it's part of the same building, but it's a different administration, the PHI. Uh, there was this or conference organized last year by uh, Dr. Bhaskar Sarkar, who was also in attendance for the last um, talk. And when he was talking about this, he mentioned that uh, the documents are being held hostage. When I heard that, I thought maybe it's an overstatement, maybe it's an exaggeration. Um, but when I went to the UCLA Film and Television Archive this April, um, an archivist and a very dear friend told me, Amrita, whatever happens, don't tell them that you're working on preservation and restoration of Ray. Just tell them you're working on preservation and restoration and visit the archive. So uh, I scheduled an appointment, I went there, and, and the archivist who had um, arranged uh, everything for me, he was kind enough. So he was like, okay, Amrita will be in this department from 10 to 10.30, 10 to 11, Amrita. So it was like a full day schedule um, that had been chalked out for me. Um, and then a very senior employee came from the Picard Humanities Institute, and he was like, you know, we heard that we have a visitor uh, from Germany, and, and she's from Bengal. Are you the one? And I said, yes, I'm from Bengal. And he said, um, we have some documents of Mr. Ray. Are you by any chance interested? Because he's also a Bengali film director. I thought to myself, am I interested? Um, of course, I said, yes, can I have a look? Uh, so I went to the hall, and it was about twice the size of this room where we are uh, currently sitting. And it was filled with these racks, um, with notebooks, um, handwritten sketches of Ray, known as, uh, they are known as Kheror Khata, so the scripts that Ray wrote, uh, some of the books that Ray published, and they're all there. 
Um, and then the employee said, you know, we're looking for a safe home. So they're not catalogued. So if something goes missing or misplaced, no one will able, be able to ever know that it was there and not there now because there's no catalog. Um, so he said, we're trying to look a safe home for these documents because, uh, you know, these are not catalogued. And I kind of didn't understand what that meant. Uh, so uh, I asked, what exactly would a safe home mean? I mean, do you want these to be transferred to Kolkata? Because uh, that was part of the Ray FASC plan. And Ray also always wanted the documents to be preserved in Calcutta because he worked there. Uh, or do you actually want to have, you know, someone who knows the language and can make a catalog for these documents? Um, and he fumbled and he was like, uh, you know, it's something that David Picard will um, will probably decide, but but let's take you to the other department. So I was gracefully shown the exit door for asking the wrong questions at the wrong place. But uh, when I was trying to work on this, um, I, I didn't know where these materials are, because apart from the film elements, the documents were also sent to Los Angeles. And after visiting UCLA Film and Television Archives, adjacent building, PHI, I do know that they are right now there uh, under uh, Mr. David Picard's um, organization. To, however, continue with the proposal for restoration, a three-year action plan was designated for the project, <coughs> scheduled to be completed in 1996. Uh, there's, there's this undated document titled Proposal for the Restoration and Preservation of Satyaji 3 Films, and it gives you the budget, besides outlining a very detailed condition of the physical condition of the reels, the methodology uh, on which the budget was prepared, and the rationale behind the transnational endeavor and also suggested that the collections would eventually be made accessible to the public. However, just as the Academy started working on the project, uh, a massive fire broke out in London's Henderson's Film Laboratories on July 20th, 1993. The negatives arrived there as a transit point um, in the route from Calcutta to Los Angeles. So London was just a transit point. Uh, and several walls of nitrate and safety-based films were either destroyed or significantly damaged by fire, including the OCNs of Jalshaghar. Uh, they were deemed unusable because of the heat damage. And uh, according to Michael Pogorzelski, no one was interested um, to bring them back to India because that would be a lot of uh, expenditure for elements which are of no use. And so Academy Film Archive decided to preserve the burnt elements. So they were taken from London to Los Angeles. Uh, Bogosowski further conjectured that Michael Friend, who had then been the director of the Academy Film Archive, had a keen interest in film technology related to restoration. And he probably hoped that in the future there might be a technology which would make these film elements usable. And apparently that was a rationale for shipping them from London to Los Angeles, uh, although they were mostly burnt. An act of faith, Saving the Opportrology, a video that's uploaded to YouTube uh, by Academy Originals, also gives an explanation of why the burnt elements were sent to Los Angeles from London. Um, so when Aurora, they, they got to know about this uh, from news that the elements had been burnt, and they were very apprehensive. So they, they sent uh, letters that, can we get certificates that the films were burnt at Henderson's? Um, there was no response. Um, then they wrote again that we are liable for compensation because the films, uh, the film elements were insured um, and therefore we should get some compensation. Um, there was no response. So they went to NFDC for help and the institution failed to oblige. Uh, a question that comes up here is uh, why exactly did Aurora go to NFDC? The reason being that the agreement had been struck between uh, is Merchant Ivory Productions or MIP uh, owned by Small Merchant and Gems Ivory, and NFDC. Um, so Ravi Gupta, who was then the MD of National Film Development Corporation, kind of had to bear the brunt because it became um, it became an issue in the Indian Parliament. There was a furore because race elements were considered uh, cultural heritage artifacts, and the fact that they were lost were not taken very kindly. Uh, so Ravi Gupta ha was answerable to both the producers who were asking him for the elements as well as to the government, the, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, and he had no response because there was no response from uh, Merchant Ivory Productions. Uh, later, uh, Ravi Gupta, during a personal interview, told me that he had never been informed that Ampus was a part of the restoration project. So when he struck a deal with um, Merchant Ivory, he only knew that it's just Merchant Ivory and Sony Pictures Classics. The question is, when did Sony Pictures Classics get into the scene? Because if you remember uh, the document that I showed you in the beginning, which showed the institutions collaborating, uh, SPC was not there. 
The answer lies here. Uh, the films were restored photochemically. Uh, the OCNs were mobilized for this purpose. And they were uh, released both on VHS formats and they were also theatrical release, uh, which happened around 1995. And uh, that was uh, done by MIP with Sony Pictures Classics and Ampus looked over the photochemical restoration of the OCNs. So there were nine films, and these are known as the original nine. Uh, and you see the titles, which are Pothar Pachali, Opera Jito, Opur Shongshar, or the Opu Trilogy, the famed Opu Trilogy. Then you see Jalshaghar, uh, the film that we are going to watch tonight. Charulata, uh, two daughters, but it's actually three daughters, but they had just uh, those reels of the film, which had two stories. So it was two daughters then. Devi, the big city, and the middleman. Out of these nine, six were burnt the famed Opu Trilogy, which is also a subject of an act of fate saving the Opu Trilogy, Jol Shaghar, uh, Devi, and uh, Dui Konna. So these were the six um, <coughs> film elements that were burned at the, at the Hendersons. Um, however, segments of the elements had been burned, and this is a report um, that was uh, prepared for Jol Shaghar. And if you see the picture negative on top, some of the reels were 70% printable, some were 80%. Um, the sound negatives were uh, in a worse condition, but the picture negatives were not completely deemed unusable, as Michael Pogorzelski had mentioned. Um, going quite against uh, what was mentioned, that it will never be theatrically released, but only be used for educational purposes, the films did uh, bring in quite a box office revenue. And here you have a report that was published on Hollywood Reporter by SPC. Towards the middle of the document, I'm sorry, it's a very bad copy, but it's all that I could manage from Academy Film Archive. You see George Agar reissue. Um, and you see that under copyright, it mentions Merchant Ivory. I'm not sure if you can see, but is there, Jol Shaghar, and the copyright shows Merchant Ivory. Ivory never had copyrights to the film. They just had the license to restore the films and send them back to India. Um, and you also see how much the film grossed at the box office, uh, which is a pretty decent amount. Now, of course, later, Aurora uh, got to know that uh, films were being theatrically screened. And when I was trying to piece uh, or, or reconstruct the entire uh, uh, restoration process, um, I, was, I was, of course, very lost because there are so many institutions. Sometimes it's SPC coming in, sometimes it's NFDC. Uh, and I think this is the letter that kind of helped me understand what really happened after the fire accident, because most of the narratives will talk about Ray receiving the Oscar, then the fire happening, and then the digital restoration happening. The narrative of the 1995 photochemical restoration is always silenced and is always never discussed. And I think this is the letter which kind of offers a glimpse into what really happened after the fire. It was written by uh, Aurora to uh, Ismail Merchant with Ravi Gupta in CC, as you can see there. Uh, and I'll read out, it says, we have been compelled to draw your attention to the fact that you are exploiting our films Oporajito and Joshakar. Without fulfilling your terms of agreement you had with NFDC, our agent for commercial exploitation outside India, with regard to our above mentioned films. It is quite depressing on our part to find out that you did not return the rejuvenated picture and sound negatives of the two films mentioned above as agreed upon by you. While in absence of the materials, we are facing a financial loss, you have started doing business in US, taking out prints from rejuvenated negatives, and at the same time putting forward undue terms like extension of time, of contract, etc., which is not at all accepted by us. We fail to understand how a reputed organization like yours, as you always try to project, could treat producer in such a manner. Under the circumstances, you are requested to return the rejuvenated picture and sound negatives of both the films to NFDC India at your earliest in the interest of good business relationship. Um, a clarification here, the word rejuvenated is kind of quite a bone of contention between producers and Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Uh, another producer, which is uh, uh, Mrs. Datta uh, of Purnima Pictures, they were also very... Uh, they were also very angry with the entire restoration process. And uh, even though Ampus still wants to restore uh, all of the race titles, it's still an ongoing project, but they did not agree to return the OCNs. The reason being this one word that was used uh, when the OCNs were being acquired from the India-based producers, which is rejuvenated. Uh, this is not a term which is used by contemporary archivists. That's what most of them told me. They usually use repaired, digitized, or restored. But uh, 
what I conjecture is that rejuvenated would probably mean uh, a repaired OCN, where probably the perforations would be repaired, it, there would have been surface cleaning, the tears would have been repaired, uh, but uh, it's a bone of contention because uh, Ampus uh, always says that there had been no such promise. The producers always maintain that this was the promise on which they sent the OCNs because they thought that if they are rejuvenated, these can be used again and they can make profits by uh, using the OCNs for taking out further uh, release prints for the films. Um, so I had to speak to Ravi Gupta, who was a signatory to the agreement, because only he would know what was the term. And he clarified that uh, rejuvenated negatives being returned to India was one of the uh, terms of the contract. The other being that profit uh, would be shared between uh, MIP, uh, or rather SPC, who were uh, theatrically, who would theatrically or uh, on VHS uh, release the films and with the producers based in India. Um, to this, Merchant did respond. And I'll read out the last segment of the letter, which says, I am also enclosing a letter from our lawyers who are pursuing the claim from the Henderson's fire. You are aware that it takes a lot of money to fight legal battles. Are you and the rights holders prepared to contribute towards this legal fight? Please let me know. The merchant was intuitive. The producers did not have the money. They did not fight a legal battle. The burned elements of six uh, of the Ray films are still there at uh, the Academy Film Archive. And if you go there, they'll offer you a tour and they'll also show you the burnt elements of Pothar Pachali. I saw them. I, they did not show me Josh Aghar. I think Josh Aghar is there. Pothar Pachali is more famous. They'll show you Pothar Pachali. But all of the six elements are still there. Uh, These same OCNs were then later uh, mobilized by Criterion for the digital restoration of the films. And uh, the Criterion version of the film was released in 2011. Uh, but I think we're not going to watch the Criterion version tonight. If I'm not wrong, we're watching the Pixion version tonight, which was a restoration done, again, digitally, but it was done in, uh, in Mumbai. I'll conclude my talk by... Um, by mentioning few fragments from my interviews, which have kind of stayed with me during the course of working on the material history of race films. Um, the first was said to me by Joseph Lindner, the senior preservation officer at Academy Film Archive, who told me, Amrita, do this belong to the Academy? No, I cannot say that the burnt film elements belong to the Academy. They are not our property. However, they are here. And if someday a producer approaches us asking about them, we will have to give them away. He also mentioned Michael Friend had very problematic acquisition policies. Besides, of course, saying that Ismail Merchant too was not very ethical in his treatment of OCNs. Um, he also mentioned the producers were never fair to Ray. If we are unfair to the producers, are we not being fair to Ray? It's a very warped argu uh, argument. It took me some time to grasp this, so I could not really respond when I was asked this question. But I will not entirely negate uh, Lindner's statements because Lindner is right. Even Aurora uh, deprived Ray of the very uh, rightful financial profits that Ray was entitled to. He was, I think, entitled 20% of the profits and Aurora never gave him his share. Uh, so there are these letters of dispute between Aurora and Ray dating somewhere in the 70s. Where Ray, where Ray writes to them that, you know, you were supposed to send me a financial statement of how much the film earned. And I was never shown that. And I was, of course, never given the money. And back then, Aurora said, fight a legal battle if you can. Back then, Ray did not fight a legal battle. So I kind of get Lindner's perspective here. But um, to kind of justify one form of exploitation by bringing it another form of exploitation was kind of very warped. And I failed to grasp it when uh, Lindner said to me, the second was something that uh, Michael Pogorzelski said to me uh, when I met him at Academy Film Archive. This was the first statement uh, uh, during our interview. Um, you must be wondering what an American archive is doing with the original elements of films made in India. Uh, my response was, I am not, but if you want to tell me, I am all ears. And uh, the, la the next sentence is something that he told me uh, after our interview was over, which is, I hope the right story gets out. I love this thing that Pogorzelski told me because uh, of the use of the word story, that he hopes that the right story gets out. Uh, Lindner's statements are important because they recognize the property uh, element of the OCNs. Uh, also because he does talk about acquisition policy, something that Michael Pogorzelski never spoke to me about. 
but uh, what stuck out for me uh, with uh, Pogorzelski's statement was that story. And it's important because what is the story that we know? The story that we know is from an act of faith, saving the Opus Trilogy, a very glor glorified narrative about how the films were saved. And this is not to deny the challenge that lay in digitally restoring the films. And I completely feel that the work that Lai Marge and Ritrovita, Ritrovata did with the, with the burnt OCNs and the digital restoration is commendable. But uh, the story that gets marginalized under all of these glorified narratives of restoring Ray and saving Ray is the fact that uh, Ampus was a part of the 1995 photochemical restoration because Merchant was producer, SPC was the distributor, photochemical restoration would, as I've already pointed out, need technical know-how. It was Ampus that supported that. Um, and when I met him at first, um, they denied, they were like, no, 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 Amrita, it was just something that Ismail Merchant did. And I'm like, yes, but who would know how to photochemically restore a film? You would need archivists, it's a, it's a specialized knowledge. And then they were like, yeah, that's, that's the part where Ampus was part of. But if you see advertisements of all of the film screenings that happened in 995, New York and, and LA, you see Ampers being credited along with Merchant Ivory Productions and Sony Pictures Classics. Uh, and the last one that uh, Anjan Bose said to me, who's the son of Ajit Bose, um, and who's the current managing director of Aurora, the, the company is, is still functional. He said, does the mother negative belong to them? Mother negative is the term they use there for referring to the original camera negative or the OCN. It is Aurora's property. Restoring the film does not make the film Academy's property. And I think this has stayed with me because uh, this uh, is precisely the point where I thought maybe I should dig deeper into the restoration story. Because prior to this, my experience with the restoration was the Film Preservation and Restoration Workshop India 2018, and uh, where it was the same narrative that the opportunity and restoring it was so difficult and the films were burned. Uh, but what what I know now is that this amazing leap that occurs that you talk about 92, you talk about the fire 93, and then straight the leap to 2011 and 2015, 1995 remains out of the discussion, but it is important. The motive of ending this talk on these fragments of interviews is to therefore recognize the power imbalance as well as archival injustice that undergirds the material history of Jol Shaghar. The geocultural politics is evident, not only in the process through which the negatives had, did, had been acquired from India, on the promise that they would be rejuvenated and that they would then be commercially exploited with a clause for profit sharing, but the politics is also evident in the lack of transparency concerning the revenues generated through the theatrical exhibition and the sale of VHS, uh, sale of the VHS, um, the sale of the film on VHS format. Further, the denial of insurance claims uh, post the fire accident and the multiple misleading narratives by the academy about how the burnt elements were retained by them. The differential exercise of power in saving Josh Aghar also, also pushes one to move beyond the jubilation of the film being saved and to critically inquire into whether the act of saving had been carried out on a very equitable basis. You might be thinking, why are the films not repatriated and why are they still lying at Academy? Uh, we can uh, talk about it during the discussion. For now, I will shut up because you should enjoy Jal Shaghar and you should uh, love the film, which is my personal uh, Ray film. So thank you for being uh, a brilliant audience and we'll talk about it again. Okay, thank you very much, Amrita. We'll break for 10 minutes and then start with the film. Well, thank you uh, once again to Amrita for that uh, amazing lecture. Uh, it kind of reminded me of a Raymond Chandler novel or something, the way there's this kind of web of deceit and lies and these objects that are kind of trying to be tracked down and so on and so forth. Um, so an amazing kind of tale you got yourself kind of uh, wrapped up in. Uh, you promised us a, an epilogue to the, <laughs> to the tale. Uh, would you mind getting into that now a little bit? No, we can we can talk about it. Um, it's still a part in pro uh, it's still a work in progress. But <coughs> I think I have two responses uh, to the fact that they still remain uh, there at the academy with all these uh, multiple glorified narratives. Um, one I would say is a definite response. The other is more like a speculative response. Um, the definite is of course bureaucracy. We have the amazing Ritika Kaushik here who's also working on that. 
Um, so Ravi Gupta was a part, uh, was a signatory to the agreement, and uh, he's no longer there at NFDC. So someone has to take this up again, the conversation, because the agreement was between MIP and um, NFDC. The other being, uh, if you remember the slide that I showed you, it had the Society for the Preservation of Satyajit Ray Films as also one of the collaborators. Uh, that was formed uh, parallelly when uh, Ray FSC was formed uh, in University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, like I said, uh, uh, it's uh, headed by Sandeep Ray, who's the son of Satyajit Ray. So I also interviewed him during um, all of this work. And uh, when I was speaking to him, I said, what is your stance on all of this? And he was like, Amrita, they should remain abroad. <laughs> so I, I wasn't sure. And I'm like, I, I think there's, there's something uh, wrong with the connection. Could you please repeat what you said? And he's like, I think they should be uh, kept abroad. And I wanted him to elaborate. Uh, so he said that um, I'm just skeptical of the producers, because if they're brought back, uh, what if they sell it for silver? Now, I do not completely buy this narrative, not because that it was not a practice in India. Of course, um, silver was extracted, but uh, I think the producers will profit more by exhibiting ray of films of Satyajit Ray than by extracting silver out of them. Uh, but it kind of goes back to the dynamic uh, that Lindner also referred to, that if we are being unfair to the producers, are we not eventually being fair to Ray? Because Ray was uh, deprived of uh, profits, not just by Aurora, but by multiple other producers as well. Uh, so one of the reasons is that Society for the Preservation of Satyajit Ray Films is kind of in charge also of this, and they are also reluctant to bring back, because the OCNs will never go to the Ray family, which also, of course, has a lot of power. Uh, they will go back to the producers, and they, there's not a very good relationship between the family and the, most of the producers. Not all, but most of the producers, I would say. Um, maybe just one more question on the on the prints, then we can talk about the film because yeah. a lot to talk about the film as well. Uh, but the why the uh, focus on the on the OCNs, you know, it's like why not you make internegatives and so on and so forth. I mean, there's there's other pathways for film restoration, but there seems to be such a focus on this this physical object. Yeah, yeah. The one that has the actual connection to the act of filming in a sense. Yeah, like it's uh, it was there in the act of fate that that specific element that passed through the camera that the director caused yeah. to cut. So of course there's a lot of value attached to that, um, which is of course the heritage value. And that's what they say that it's sacred and it has to be preserved. But when I spoke to film restorers and Li uh, Lindner also spoke about it, I'm like, why this obsession? Because you have interpositives, you have the answer prints, you have the uh, release prints. So, And then he said, Amrita, it's always the best possible source element <coughs> for any restoration exercise. The restorers would first want the OCN because uh, apparently with each print that you make from it, there is a generational loss in the quality. So they want the OCN. And in case the OCN is not there, then they'll scout for other elements, which was the case with other restorations, for example, where they did not find the OCN. But if there's the OCN, then that will be uh, the priority. And then you'll go for the other elements. OK. Um, you said this was your favorite of Ray's films. Tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> um, Firstly, because I'm more uh, interested in the industrial context. So when I started reading the, the, the documents, I, I liked Ray taking charge and Ray commanding. Um, it was also that when Pothar Pachali came out, it was all, also about, you know, that he goes out of the studio system, there's on location shooting. And here you see his mastery uh, in the studio space. So it's not that he couldn't do a film in the studio. It's just that he did not have the infrastructures for Pothar Pachali. But when he did acquire them, I love his mastery. A lot of critics have uh, noted about how he uses space and time. And of course, not to even get into there, but the, the very sense, uh, the very way in which he uses it and musical, uh, his use of song and dance. Now, Ray had also a version of it is there in uh, our films, their films, where he says that, you know, I do not have uh, much luck with the distributors. And I thought if song and dance works so well, maybe I should use song and dance. and. Well, st while still sticking to my own artistic sensibility, I make a film which still has song and dance so that distributors want to distribute the film. Uh, and I, uh, I so b before this, there was, uh, there was Pothar Bachali, there was Opera Jito, and there was Porosh Pathor, which is more like a comedy. And it's very difficult um, to fit this into the genre of films that he had already made by then. And I think that's why George Chakot stands out personally for me. There's a real, um, well, at least I found at least, a, um, a real trance-like quality to the music 
sequences that really, as a spectator, you kind of get taken away by. Uh, I would say. I mean, is there? Do you know much about how he conceived the the musical sequences? What his thinking was behind them? Uh, as in how he shot the musical stories? Well, how, yeah, or like what what was his kind of approach to the filming of these musical stories? Um, firstly, that uh, the fact that the zamindar is a connoisseur should mm -hmm. should be filmed. So Shubroto Mitro had that instruction that the fact that Bishambo Rai knows, because if you remember in the first Joshua sequence, Mohim uh, is he's clearly shown in a caricaturish manner like he's kind of a misfit and he does all these things with the nose and all of it and he's like you know you don't you pos position him in a way that he doesn't know how to appreciate that form of music while the zamindar knows how to do it and even though there are other follies about it and i think that's one of the reasons that a lot of critics have said that ray is empathetic to the character he's not critical and he's not also um you know um, very he's not glorifying it as well but he's very empathetic to his love for music so that was one uh, the the second was um so like i said that when this film was released all of these performers were also known in calcutta back then they, they had a currency of their own because whenever boshu Shri or i think even prachi had all of these jol shash uh Roshan Kumari performed, Vilatka performed. Uh, there's this uh, Shehenai, which is played. You you hear it on the on the musical, uh, but you don't see. So that was played by Bismillah Khan, and he was also invited uh, to Boshu Shri. So that was also one thing that these performances should be foregrounded in a way that audiences do connect to the film. And so audiences at the time would have known the performers, like kind of that were just part of the cultural currency. That was part of the elite. You have uh, the, the there's this term called the called Bhadralog, which again is a specific class caste coordinate and. Uh, I have to talk a bit to explain this, but uh, so this happened in 50s and 50s is the decade right after partition and independence and uh, partition kind of changed the, the Bengal, uh, the filmmaking map in, in Bengal. Uh, for a lot of reasons, first of all, because of uh, the bifurcation of the area, most of the cinema halls went to uh, Bangladesh. Uh, the cinema halls in Bengal took an advantage of that and they started asking for a lot of money from producers uh, to show the film. So there were all of these crises happening. Studios were shut down. Uh, there were financial losses. And at the same time, Bombay-based song and dance films became a hit in Kolkata. And industrial players were anxious of it. And they thought that there is one way that we gain this, this market which should belong to Bengali film and not really Hindi film. So there was this anxiety. And that said that we don't go into glamorous, vulgar song and dance sequences. That is, by the way, a myth because Bengali films also had song and dance sequences. But it was kind of a, an industrial manufactured myth that do not listen to that song and dance, listen to the classical song and dance. And that was part of the project because most of these editorials in elite cultural journals would be like, uh, the, you know, the we have... Uh, we have gained reputation for literature. Tagore won the Nobel Prize. Uh, we are reputed for theater, and we have to do something about films. And that's when you connect it to classical and give it a specific currency. And that's the reason that this did connect to the urban um, uh, audiences. Yeah. Um, questions from the audience? Ritika has the roving mic. Sebastian. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I, I noticed in like the mansion or like just in general, uh, like how the mansion is sort of structured, I noticed like a lot of sort of Western objects in that mansion, like clearly that's sort of uh, some form of like cultural exchange going on there. Is that like sort of an, an, like a, a nod to like like the whole like imperialist phase or is this like is is this, is there like a an overt political connotation to like sort of i mean there was like the grandfather clock and like all these like smaller objects and stuff i don't know like yeah, i can talk <laughs> about it i mean i spoke a bit about the zamindari system this film is kind of based uh, in the beginning of 20th century so it should be around the decade of 1920s and zamindars were working in alignment with the British regime. They did not really go much against uh, the British, barring a few um, from Bengal. I'm speaking specifically of Bengal here. Um, so being English educated, going abroad to learn English, that was also part of the zamindari family. Um, so it was like <coughs> sons of zamindars would go abroad, get educated. And you see, he also speaks English. He's like, uh, to, to you, my noble ancestors, so uh, there was a there was a nexus. So you acquire uh, those objects. Uh, that's a part of the decor. And later, actually, when uh, when when zamindars were 
not uh, because a lot of these were auctioned like this. It's it's not just one story that that kind of tells about what happened to Zamindas much later when they could not maintain the property, um, when the economic uh, system changed. And this film is also about that specific change because you you see the novo rich coming up who are investing into trade, who are uh, also you know buying all this English furniture, which was then uh, something that only the Zamindars owned. But then here they say that Mohim has got you know English furniture that he's bringing to his house. Uh, so uh, these were later kept at antique stores in Calcutta when, when there were no longer zamindas in Calcutta. And if you had to make period films, you had to go to antique stores to get all of these. Because uh, whenever you want to talk about 19, uh, the, the beginning of 20th century or even mid 19th century, I would say, you would have to have those furniture. And you see it across. You also see it in Charulata. Uh, Devi also has some of these objects. Uh, and uh, from what I know, uh, this is from an anecdote that uh, Vishnu Priya, who was the former speaker in this series, who told me that uh, one of the objects in this film were, was actually taken on a hire from her grandfather, but they apparently uh, abused the objects, they were not handled properly, and then her grandfather refused. He was like, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you any more of the, of the objects. So that's how. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, maybe just a little bit more on the mansion, too. I mean, it seems to have... Uh, a very strong personality in the film uh, and almost a kind of life of its own. Uh, it becomes progressively also inhabited by life, animals, uh, spiders, pigeons, and so on and so forth. But there's also a sense in which uh, the house is kind of involved in the narrative in a very active way. I wonder if you wanted to speak a bit more about the role of the house in the film. Yeah, it, it is important. And that's why Ray scouted a lot to get the perfect location. I mean, he also mentions in this article that I mentioned, uh, the winding route to the music room, that they actually kept on looking for uh, the, the Zamindari palace. They just couldn't find one which would both match the description that was there in Tara Shankar Banerjee's uh, short story. And also one where you get the mood, because this film is also about the specific mood. And that's what Ray also talks about, that, you know, when I went there, you see Podda, you see the wastelands, you see the sandbanks, and you, you get that, you get a claustrophobic feeling, because he's stuck in the palace. The only moment he gets out is when he, he meets his death. Otherwise, he's just stuck there. Uh, so Ray did one, and uh, with the, the the pillars and all, they were they were built uh, on the sets. So that was part of Narkel Danga. They were built with plaster of Paris uh, because some of the shots where Ray wanted to take the river or to take the exterior from the indoor, the the windows were not large enough to allow for that, and so that's why they had to make parts of those in the studio again, which also led to uh, higher uh, cost of production. Uh, but it is definitely a character in the film. It, it's it's not an exaggeration to say that uh, Ray wanted to invest all of that to have that. Uh, some critics uh, who watched uh, the film in 1960s when it was released in uh, Broadway, London, they also said it has a certain goth gothic quality to it, uh, just the mansion and everything. So uh, that I felt that very strongly, actually. So I that could, is I not accidental. I felt a lot uh, of parallels with the fall of the House of Usher, in particular. <laughs> Do you know? If it was that a overt reference for Ray, do you think? I am not sure because I haven't read about it, but but Ray was a cinephile and he was, of course, influenced not just by Italian neurals, but he was also, he was a massive, uh, you know, he, he just watched, he was a film buff. So I wouldn't be surprised if he had these influences, but I can't comment on it for sure because I haven't uh, read him talking about this. Uh, the question, yes, to be yes. Hi. Um, yeah, not m not so much a question, but a commentary. Like uh, with the mansion um, and the uh, like, gothic feeling. I also had um, to the performance of the main protagonist uh, was uh, reminded me a little bit of a uh, bit of Dracula. Like with the he has lots of uh, makeup in the first part, where he's always calm and uh, so powerful. And then I also thought about Orson Welles' character in Citizen Kane. Like in Xanadu, like um, first having this lavish lifestyle and um, enjoying power, and then getting more and more drawn back and never going out anymore. And also, like um, the musical performance, had this you had some realism and then some um, the documentary uh, performance, uh, also capturing these performances. And in the end, his acting when he saw the lights going out, it was like from a silent horror film or something like his eyes were so big 
and um, there, there were no words, just sudden movements. So it was really impressive. And I also to the music, I, I in the credits there was a Ravi Shankar uh, credit. Is the Ravi Shankar or? Not for this. For this, it's Ustad Vilayat Khan who composed the music for this one. I think in the credit music, Ravi Shankar was written in the beginning. So I was wondering. If Ravi Shankar did it for Pothir Bajali, but for this, uh, it was Vilayat Khan for sure. Oh, really? It was in the in the first credits. Maybe s maybe some of the background, but mostly uh, it was composed by by Vilayat Khan, because Ravi Shankar and Ray also had a tiff later on, and then Ray started uh, composing music himself for his later films. Oh, okay, yeah, thanks. But uh, the booklet, uh, which which I also showed, that also just credits Vilayat Khan. So back then, it was only Vilayat Khan who was credited. So. Mm -hmm. I, I, it actually missed my attention, but maybe segments. But the major credit always goes to Ustad Vilayat Khan for this uh, for this film. Um, I had I had a question about uh, if you could tell us something more about how the film was received at the time in Bengal, but also internationally. Like, was there um, similarities between Ray's earlier films, the way they were received, or did this one stand out? Like, anything you could tell us about? Uh. It didn't uh, win uh, major awards at the time. It just won for its music at Moscow, uh, the Moscow Film Festival. And uh, in India, I think it received the Certificate of Merit from the national awards and not much beyond that. But I read the reviews that were published uh, by the critics who were working for uh, Broadway. And uh, they were charmed by the chandelier, the palace, uh, the musical performances and uh, the, the, the interior of, of the studio. So that was mostly wha what captivated uh, them. But uh, there had actually been uh, criticisms for uh, Biswas's acting because a lot of people felt that it was very theatric. It also goes a bit away from the Pothir Pachali mode of... Uh, but uh, Bis Biswas had a background in uh, theatrical acting, of course. So it also, what you said, I, I forget who talked about it, yeah, but... Um, so, so the elements um, are there, but the major criticism came from the zamindars of the time. Mm. Um, so uh, the Ichapur uh, zamindar, uh, they were very pissed uh, <laughs> because the specific sequence where you see um, that that insect floating um, in the liquor, uh, they didn't understand the symbolism that Ray was trying to hint at, and uh, they took it as a comment on zamindari's. Uh, hygiene level and they were like no we don't have that uh, it's, it's not like that so uh, they, they actually also wrote apparently to aurora that how could you have a sequence like that like, what is the image you're projecting like is that how our hygiene level is and they were like you have to understand you know it's a story it's a narrative and that's a symbol uh, so so the zamindars were not very pleased with that specific sequence uh, the urban uh, elite audience they loved it which explains why it ran at radha purna prachi and it also did uh, generate massive revenues from Lucknow, Allahabad and, and all that belt. So there it ran. Well, it wasn't distributed a lot in the south of India and I don't know why. I asked uh, Anjan Bose and he was like, I don't have an explanation, but it was majorly distributed uh, in the north, west and east mostly. And the revenues came in primarily from Calcutta, for, for Bengal. Not that it wasn't uh, distributed beyond Calcutta, but majorly uh, from Radha Purna Prachi. I would like to ask a question about the relationship between earth and water in the movie. We see uh, Zaminda, uh, Joe, Minda, I think it's a Bengali pronunciation, who cannot keep his his land, he cannot keep his earth, he cannot keep his Zamin to together. Um, first, the, wat the earth is washed away by the river or is it part of, a, of the sea? Maybe tide is going in and out, but during the movie, the water comes closer and closer to the mansion, to the palace, until the end when the um, water moves away. But then he goes out there in the, into the into the area which has been abandoned by the by the water, and he and he dies. And his wife is accusing him that he is not able to um, keep the land together f um, from the floods. And after, and then um, 
his wife and his son is taken away from the from him by the water and but in the end it's not the water anymore um the his land is repossessed by the banks or by the creditors or by the um usurers and only a small piece of land is um left and the pr he's giving away the proce last proceeds to the dancer and i have a qu um question about the title of the movie um the word jal or jol sounds to me like water but not um every day not um pedestrian water but water in a exceedingly pure quality and the word zaga doesn't so sound it like ocean or like sea or and so but it the word jal zaga or jol soccer is used for the music room in a so the music room is called by this um metaphor and um Bengal is the land where um the water flows into the in to the sea and so this um this summer he doesn't go with the time he doesn't want electric light in his in his home and we see this we hear this ridiculous sound of the of the electric generator um intruding into the musical home and um so it's a very melancholic um, and nostalgic movie but at the same time we see the progress of modernity and um this guy he goes out um in style in a flamboyant um way and on the other hand we see this um nouveau rich guy and he is making his money from exploiting um the river from exploiting like mining or illegal mining or what no or um, whatever and um so um did i get this relationship between earth and water um yeah yeah you, you got the relationship uh, right i also did not really think about the jal and sagar uh, but it does make sense um, jal does mean water uh sagar does mean the sea so um mhm mm um but the specific fact uh, it has also a historical context uh the beginning of 1900 so 1910 1920 uh, and 1930 uh, not just floods but th there were also time for agricultural depression 1920s there was an agricultural depression in bengal 1930s as well uh, also there was the 1885 uh, land tenancy act that was also passed in bengal which uh, also prohibited the arbitrary rent enhancing powers of the zamindars all of these together with the floods the depression and the land tenancy act uh, did prove a major setback for zamindars and um, which is why i said that it's not a singular example but that was a time when a lot of zamindars were actually unable to keep their property he of course falls into the type which was criticized back then as the idle rich uh, because he did not uh, he was not very attentive to the to the zamindar in itself uh, which is why his wife also mocked him but even for zamindars who were attentive to the land uh, because of all these natural um, calamities uh, it, it was a setback time for zamindari system in in itself maybe time for one last question before we call it a night Hello. Um, do you think, uh, for example, Raj Kapoor had any influence uh, on uh, such a day, especially in the use of singer, song and dance sequences in his films? Raj Kapoor. I... I'm skeptical. I am not very sure. Um, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I can't answer for Ray, but I haven't uh, read anything in relation to it. But uh, it wouldn't be like I said because he was always uh, attentive to films that were being made at the time. Um, Jalsha Ghor is also not not an exception. There was Amropali kind of that released in Bengal as a musical also around the same time. 
Um, so Ray for sure was attentive to the fact that this specific kind of film was drawing audience. But whether, uh, but Raj Kapoor's way of song and dance is very different from the way he has shot the classical performance, but performative sequences here. Yeah, that's, that's right, but he sets uh, the formula for public success. Um, perhaps on this level, uh, Ray thought this could be an element of, my, of his films to secure a certain kind of public success. It's a good yeah. way. I will uh, differentiate public here a, a bit because it, it matters a lot for, for the post-partition Bengali film culture. Uh, the reason being one was uh, one set of audience were the immigrants, not just who were coming in from Bangladesh at that time, but also who were coming in from Bihar and all these other regions to secure work in Bengal. And these specific set of audiences loved the Bombay song and dance films. And that is why Bombay song and dance was doing so good in Bengal, in Calcutta at that time. So much so that Chitra a Cinema Hall, which belonged to BN Sarkar and who kind of owned new theatres, which was this massive studio in Bengal uh, in 1930s. When that started screening, uh, Hindi films, uh, all these cultural journals, Rupo Katha, Rupo Moncho, they kind of went out against it. Like this is a stronghold of Bengali culture. That was the word they wrote. And they were like, if this gives in to Bombay-based song and dance films, then what will happen to Bengali cinema? Safe Bengali cinema was also pertinent then, not in the terms of, well, photochemical restoration or digital restoration saving, but saving an industry. That was also pertinent because of the after effects, um, aftermath of partition. Uh, the specific clientele that even Aurora wanted was the urban elites and they were as as a specific class caste community they were not very much appreciative of the song and dance sequences they prefer the classical and um, you know the, the Tagore and, and that is why you also see Tagore scripts being used Bunkim's uh, stories being used so it's, it's a different type of public that Aurora wanted to tap with this audience and uh, uh, with with Ray, uh, he just loved the story of of Tara Shankar, and he wanted to give uh, a bit of materialized form that the way he had imagined it. So I wouldn't say that Ray is one who would think of box office numbers, but if I have to think of someone who is thinking of strategies to appeal to the public, it would be Aurora, because Aurora also had this reputation building strategies of its own. And we don't do popular films, we don't do star films, we do this you know very literary films, and uh, we are for the elites. So Aurora also had this kind of reputation to build for itself. So it's a different type of public that it wanted, but of course it wanted a it wanted audience for sure. Okay, thank you. All right, well we might call it a night there. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks' time. Uh, for Rachana Majumda talking about Jana Aranya uh, on the 21st of December, so just before Christmas. Uh, but right now, once again, thank you so much to Amrita for that wonderful talk and discussion. Thank you for being a brilliant audience.